Green banks really enable that to happen by taking some risk and demonstrating to the private sector, you know what, a bet on uh, vulnerable communities because not only are these the communities that have uh, not been uh, the pri primary contributors to the problem, but they are bearing the brunt of the problems. For me, it's, it's, it's balancing, um, you know, complacency, optimism, and anxiety about the climate, and really trying to find that balance of, we are doing amazing work. Like, that is an impact metric that you can't measure. So, having a vision of a planet protected by the love of humanity is that. You can't have environmentalism without humanitarianism. You can't, you know, you can't save the trees by avoiding people. Hello, and welcome to season two of Conversations on Climate, in which I've been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Brian, Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time here and hosting us at the Yale School of Management and you know, arranging for us to have this wonderful conversation. We're here to talk today about the Connecticut Green Bank. And if you don't mind, um, starting with, with yourself, Brian, would you uh, give me a kind of one sentence um, pitch for the Connecticut Green ah. Bank, but with a focus on the mission? Oh, well, well good. Uh, Sarah, Sarah will probably say that that would be difficult for Brian to do. <laughs> but, but no, our mission is to confront climate change. Okay. And we do that by increasing and accelerating investment in Connecticut's green economy mm -hmm. to create healthier, uh, equitable, and more resilient communities. Fantastic. And Sarah, your one sentence pitch, but more focusing on what makes you so proud to be uh, part of the bank? I think that green banking and the Connecticut Green Bank is a really cool model for how you can accelerate the deployment of the clean energy technology economy and get it into the hands of those who need it most. Amazing. Thank you. So you both come from really vastly different backgrounds. Like Brian, you're like former Peace Corps, um, you know, uh, lo local politics. Uh, Sarah, you're um, an engineer, and you know your first kind of journey into climate was, if I'm correct if I'm wrong, but trying to put a Vestas <laughs> turbine on the top of like, your, your, your parents' Science house. fair experiment. So, yep. Yeah, so, so it's, <laughs> it's, yeah it's, uh, it, could, it could start the whole climate journey <laughs> in a practical sense. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about your, your journey to, to, to this point now, to, to, to your roles in the Greenback? Sure. You want, you want me to start? Sure, yeah. Um, so we're here in New Haven. Uh, mm -hmm. I was born in Southern California, so a lot different uh, weather conditions in mm -hmm. here. So uh, Southern California, but moved to Northern California, uh, went to UC Berkeley, was a Peace Corps volunteer, as you noted, uh, in the Republic of Kazakhstan. Uh, they had several programs there. One was environmental NGO capacity building. That's where I was a volunteer. Uh, at that time, I had had a career ambition of being involved in foreign service, um, but uh, came back home after that Peace Corps service, went to grad school. That's what brought me back out here uh, to New Haven, to the Yale School of the Environment, and uh, just found you know, my passion here for renewable energy, uh, specifically here in the state of Connecticut through that experience. So I graduated from here. Uh, I was recruited by a local clean energy fund, our predecessor, uh, which is a quasi-public uh, agency called Connecticut Innovations. They're a venture capital fund. They were administering this clean energy fund and they knocked on my door once and they said, we're creating this fund. Uh, we saw your resume and we're interested in, in bringing you in to come and potentially work for us. And I was like, I couldn't tell you the difference between a kilowatt hour and a kilowatt. Perhaps you should talk to one of my classmates. <laughs> and they were like, well, no, this is about working within the community and creating and advancing new technologies. So, uh, and I've really fallen in love with clean energy ever since. Um, uh, was involved in uh, coordinating Connecticut's climate change efforts underneath two Republican governors. Uh, so you, you, you figure out ways of talking about how to uh, advance solutions to climate change by doing that. Uh, but no, it's just great to be here uh, with Sarah uh, and you uh, to talk about the Connecticut Green Bank. Amazing. And Sarah? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I come from this from a technology background rather than a policy background. So um, I really got interested in clean energy as a, as a solution that I was passionate about early on. As you mentioned, I, I did a science fair experiment to say what would happen if we installed a wind turbine in my parents' backyard could we offset the power that my family consumed and I did not use good science. Um, I found a model for a utility scale Vestas turbine and said, let's put that in my <laughs> residential backyard. Um, and I have, came up with the amazing result that it could power not only my family's house, but the entire street um, and presented that and to 
nobody's surprised, but my own did not advance to the next round of the science fair experiment, <laughs> science fair uh, competition. Um, but that really got me started on this journey. And so um, I was doing some volunteer work around clean energy when I was in high school and I got really frustrated with people's interaction with energy. They were dismissive of climate change. They were uh, frustrated about how complicated it was to get into the clean energy or even to sign up for a PPA for offshore wind. And I was like, forget the people, I'm just gonna go design a better system for them to use. Uh, so I went to engineering school, did uh, civil engineering, ended up working as an energy engineer, designing energy efficient buildings and power plants uh, across the US and around the world. Um, got to work on a lot of campuses and um, realized that you can't just build a better system. The people are a really important part of that mix. And so came back to Yale where I did uh, my master's of environmental management at the Yale School of the Environment and my MBA here at the School of Management, um, focused on energy policy and energy finance. Um, came out of the other side really interested in this question of, we have all of this mature proven energy technology, but we're not deploying it. Like how, how can we get to that place where uh, it's accessible to everybody and every, it's not um, a question of if, it's more a question of what next. Um, and so went to go work on that problem uh, on the utility side and then two years ago joined Brian at the Green Bank to work on it from the finance side. It's been a really um, interesting uh, place to work at this intersection of technology and policy and finance and how do you get everything working in concert to work too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. That's where I come fantastic. from. Fantastic. And one thing you both have in common, as you both mentioned, is, is this, this institution, yeah. is, is Yale. What parts the, has Yale played in your, your career development? Oh, well, as I was just going over my introduction, is, is instrumental. I mean, when I came here, I knew a lot about the, the physical parts of the energy system, but not a lot about um, what people um, what, what people are thinking about when they actually decided to invest in it or um, the policy that enabled the expansion of that technology. And so um, over my three years here, I, I did <laughs> maybe up to like a third of my credits in independent studies, um, sort of leveraging <clears throat> the Yale network to expand um, my knowledge about the regulatory side, the utility side, the different players in technology and policy and finance. And um, yeah, I mean, it really set me on the path that I'm on now. Yeah, and I would just add, what an extraordinary institution, right? You're getting a sense of it having been a student here yourself. But um, I was the class of 2000, so the 100th year anniversary of the Yale School of the Environment, that was the class that I was in. So, you know, I, I came into a school that was founded by Gifford Pinchot, you know, Teddy Roosevelt. So the ethics of conservation were fundamental. You know, the, the facilities that we see today uh, weren't around when I was studying here. Um, so we were very much in the old uh, School of Forestry and Environmental Studies here at the school. Um, so just an extraordinary experience. Um, obviously, for both Sarah and I has had an extraordinary influence on how we think about the world, our colleagues who are out there fighting the fight in their various respective ways that they're doing. Um, but as I went out into the world at Connecticut Innovations, they brought me back because uh, uh, we wanted to create a partnership between the Yale School of Management and the Yale School of the Environment through something called the Center for Business in the Environment at Yale. So we all know Stuart DeCue here uh, has done an extraordinary job of preparing environmental leaders for business and society and providing students with places to come together with their different disciplines and try to attack problems from different disciplines because you can't just go at them with one thing, engineer, technology, finance, policy. You know, even today with social sciences, we have to begin to have better conversations with people to make, you know, things influential and things happen. Uh, but no, this is a super, super special place. Uh, and it's just great to come back any time, any chance I get to come south uh, from Hartford to get here. Uh, it's always great to be back here on campus with all the students and faculty. Um, but we now go to the Green Bank itself. Um, now, we, in this series, uh, we've done quite a lot of talking about climate financing, uh, but we've never uh, never touched on the idea of, uh, of green banks. Uh, could you tell us, like, what is a green bank most, most kind of fundamental, and what makes a difference to commercial banks that people will be more, you know... Yeah, so, so it's definitely different. Mm -hmm. I mean, we provide uh, families and businesses with the capital they need to finance clean energy improvements. So okay. it's less about financing those utility-scale wind uh, projects or offshore wind farms, but more about providing families and businesses with the capital they need to, to uh, uh, improve their energy lives, reduce their energy costs and the like. Uh, but we're very, very diverse. I mean, you know, there are green banks at the state level. 
You've got green banks from Maine to Hawaii. You've got green banks from Illinois and Michigan to Puerto Rico. Uh, they come in different flavors. Some are quasi public like us, happy to go into like what that means. Some are public, specifically under government. Some are nonprofit. So we come in different forms. Uh, we're also at different levels. Some uh, like us are at the state level. We've got county level green banks like the Montgomery County Green Bank. We've got local uh, city green banks in Philadelphia. So it's just uh, an extraordinary uh, group of different financial institutions who fundamentally believe not about the bottom line, financial bottom line, but fundamentally about social and environmental bottom line. So we are driven by delivering those benefits to society. Um, uh, we do a lot of different things. All of us do uh, very different things given the climate that we're in, uh, given the public policy structures that we operate in. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think what green banks do is take a limited amount of public funding and try to mobilize multiples of private capital because we can't solve the climate problem on the back of governments and taxpayers. We actually need to lift up the private sector and enable their investment so that we can achieve the solutions that we're after. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that, that's a bit about uh, what a green bank is. I, I think of it as we're training the private market at, to go. invest in the green economy. Um, you know, when you have a private bank, they have a very specific risk portfolio um, and they are not always well suited to take investments into a sector that they don't know, like residential rooftop solar 10 years ago. Um, and so the role of a green bank is to come in, demonstrate that that is a financeable product uh, and, and essentially train them in such a way using different financial tools and mechanisms. Um, to such to the point where now we no longer provide investments into market rate residential rooftop solar because the Connecticut um, community lending bank institutions understand that market now. So so that for us is what success looks. Yeah, like. and and a lot of times like there can be gaps in the marketplace where private capital doesn't want to flow. Um, so where there are gaps and green banks can help fill it to mobilize private investment, uh, that's definitely a place that we play. Um, you know, low income and disadvantaged communities, environmental justice communities, there is an unconscious bias in this country around uh, the viability of wanting to invest in these communities. And green banks really enable that to happen by taking some risk and demonstrating to the private sector, you know what, a bet on uh, vulnerable communities because not only are these the communities that have uh, not been uh, the pri primary contributors to the problem, but they are bearing the brunt of the problem. So uh, we need to <laughs> invest more of them in them and by enabling private sector to partner with us, we, we can do that. And is this by uh, taking the, the technological leadership and saying that, that we understand this stuff, uh, we are putting our money into it, so therefore you can, you can trust us and follow it? Or do you, do you try to Slice, slice out the risk and say, well, we'll take this portion, this first portion of the risk, and then, you, then and therefore de-risk the project yeah. to, to a certain extent to have other people follow in. I, I think technology risk was the driver initially in the green, yeah. trying to alleviate that risk. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of, you know, as the markets change, technologies change, that, that will constantly be a risk. But I think um, financial risk is the big one that we hedge. So I'm reminded as you're asking that question, Chris, of one of our first meetings when uh, we were created back in 2011 was with the Connecticut Bankers Association. So you could imagine every state has a bankers association, uh, the country has a bankers association, and we were talking to them about the introduction of this legislation and us. And uh, the chairman of the Connecticut Bankers Association says to me, uh, Brian, it's all well and good, uh, but the last thing we want to see is another government-backed financial institution standing in front of our business. And uh, you could imagine initially, I was like, wait, we're supposed to be partnering here. So my response was yes, uh, but what we want to do is to de-risk transactions to get your capital into supporting the public policies that the state of Connecticut wants to, to achieve. And uh, I think over you know, the last decade, we've been in operation now for 12 years, we've been able to do that. And I think if you talk to, to commercial banks today, what they would say is, Green Bank, give us more projects, because we're helping to not only de-risk technology, uh, because we get it, commercially available technology, we're not only able to de-risk the financial, you know, the ability of a counterparty to repay uh, a loan, uh, but we're also, um, we also understand the policy climate. And, and policy is important. You know, financial institutions don't spend a lot of time in energy and climate policy. Well, we know how 
uh, important policy is to enabling procurement and targets and incentives and all those sorts of things. So when you pull all those things together, green banks fundamentally play that glue in the system to bring the policy mechanisms of the state together with the financial markets so that we can get the results that we're after. So could we go back, because um, you just touched on it there, to, to like the origin story. Like I'm particularly interested to, to, to know how you managed to get kind of bipartisan supports. Like it, this, it's <laughs> so the, the origin story is actually a really interesting one. And it's, and it's from the federal, a failed federal government policy. Uh, that comes into the creation of a, a state policy. So if we go back, and it comes back to here, I think. Uh, um, so the American Clean Energy and Securities Act of 2009, uh, here in the US, it's known as the Waxman-Markey Bill, the cap and trade bill. Yep. Uh, they were proposing uh, creating a national cap and trade for CO2 emissions. Um, the bill had passed the House on a partisan basis, but never passed the Senate. There was a component of the bill that was brought up in committee that was the creation of a clean energy deployment administration that was effectively a national climate bank. You take all these proceeds from the national cap and trade system, you put them in this bank, you provide that as low cost capital to states and local governments and you can get accelerated deployment of clean energy. Well, the bill didn't pass, but the proponent of the bill, Reed Hunt, who was a graduate of this institution, uh, the Yale School, the law school here, um, uh, led the Coalition for Green Capital and he was the proponent of this bill. He was on a panel here at an innovation conference very much like what we are here today. Uh, and I was at the Center for Business and the Environment. And I remember saying, wow, this idea is super, super interesting. Uh, several years after that panel, he had come to Connecticut when a professor from the Yale School of the Environment and the law school, Dan Esty, uh, was becoming the commissioner here in the state of Connecticut of environmental protection. And Reed talked to Dan and said, well, what do you think about taking this concept and trying to do it at the state level? Uh, so we had incoming an inc a new governor uh, moving from a Republican governor to a Democrat in Governor Daniel Malloy from Stanford. Uh, that first legislative session was effectively uh, created the Public Act uh, 1180 that was unanimously bipartisan. I think there was only two no votes in both the House and the Senate on the bill. Uh, it was a major act, a 135 section bill. We were section 99 of that bill, uh, but amazingly bipartisan. And I think when you think about the role of government to use limited resources to attract and mobilize private, that that is a bipartisan position that you can wrap your arms around. And uh, we've been operating that way ever since. Uh, but uh, you know, here uh, we'll, you will find in New England that our states are very bipartisan when it comes to the issue of climate change. Um, the Green Bank model is a mechanism to help us get there. Okay. So in the general climate narrative, we have uh, people tend to hear about the really big numbers, like the $369 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act, or just really hard to comprehend level, levels of funding. Uh, but if we're talking about you know, the work of the, the Green Bank, it's all about taking those big numbers and um, pu putting them into local action and trying to, trying to make uh, impacts on local communities. Can you tell us how, how the Green Bank facilitates that? How do you translate the, bi the big numbers and flow them down into helping local levels? Well, I think what Brian just said, that it comes from policy, is really inherent to how we think about that activity. We think about where is the Connecticut environmental policy driving towards, where should it be driving towards, where can it be supported by commercially ready available technology, and how, um, where are the areas where capital is a barrier to the deployment of that technology. So uh, a good example, a few years ago, um, Connecticut passed a goal to install 1,000 megawatts of storage. There was no program to deploy that storage technology. We worked through the regulatory process in Connecticut to help develop a program uh, to support the deployment of storage, um, both at the residential and the commercial scale, and thought about, you know, the, the the barriers of commercial and residential storage are myriad. They involve uh, a nascent market, a lack of contractors uh, that know and are willing to install the technology, a high upfront cost that has only increased since we launched the program, <laughs> um, and, and just general market awareness. You know, people knew Tesla, and that was pretty much it. Um, and so thinking about how can um, you know, the state agencies, including us working in concert, develop a program to deploy that and how can finance be part of the solution to address the high upfront cost. Thinking about how finance and green banking uh, can be a solution to achieve some of the very ambitious policy goals that are in the state is, is one of the places that we start. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, when you think about those big utility scale projects, like, I mean, obviously all our northeastern states here 
um, have very ambitious offshore wind goals, right? And, and what they do is they then institute uh, procurement policies. They, they issue requests for proposals to create competition in the market to get the market to deliver those, those projects. The, cap, the level of capital needed for those targets is astronomical, right? It, it, but now you're operating in a global market and you've got all these very in, influential factors that are gonna affect your local decision making. Uh, but small can work, right? Small is very quick. Uh, you can get a lot of things done, a lot of deployment happening. Um, I think here in Connecticut, uh, we've got a great public policy structure uh, on the, the residential side. Sarah was talking about battery storage. On the residential rooftop solar side, uh, we are the largest per capita deployer of rooftop solar. Uh, we use the least amount of incentives and we deploy more solar for uh, low to moderate income families proportionately than other states. Um, but you, you, when you, ha you have to have all these things working together, the contractors, the financing, the, the policies, the regulations, of course, the commercially available technology. Um, but you can build it to scale at a smaller level by just going at it. Um, and that's what we've been doing uh, quite a bit here in Connecticut. Okay, great. Um, and while uh, Connecticut Green Bank was the first in the, in the US, um, doesn't mean that you've been you know, resting on your laurels and uh, you, you, you have been evolving. Um, so what's the 2011? Uh, you moved from being primarily focused on, on renewables into um, environmental infrastructure. Can you tell us a little bit about what, you know, what the thinking was behind that? Yeah, so, so in 2021, actually, 20. so it's a decade after we were created through that public act that I was talking about, you know, we had demonstrated the model, the Green Bank model, how you can unlock private investment to help us accelerate clean energy deployment, especially for the most vulnerable. Um, but then became the question from uh, Governor Lamont, who was an alumni of the Yale School of Management, who said uh, through his uh, climate change uh, council, um, you know, what can you recommend to me uh, that I can do to help advance public policy to confront climate change? And one of the recommendations that came from his council was to um, expand the scope of the Connecticut Green Bank to include environmental infrastructure. So beyond clean energy that we, we think about, like you know, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, how can this model unlock private investment in things like land conservation, parks and recreation, agriculture, water, climate adaptation and resilience? Can the model be applied to these other areas of modernizing our environmental infrastructure so that we can use the green economy to effectively make us more resilient, create more equity in our communities, deliver on the mission of the Green Bank? So again, that bill passed in 2021 on a bipartisan basis. Uh, we're still trying to figure it out. I, I feel like, Sarah, the team you know, back in headquarters, uh, uh, Ashley Stewart, Lee Welton, Bert Hunter, all the team back there are working super hard now with the whiteboard to figure out how we can use the model to apply to environmental infrastructure. One of the things that the legislature gave us was the ability to issue a 50-year bond, which I think is an incredible financial tool. How we use that in a responsible way that attracts private investment to fund these sorts of things uh, is what we're working on. Mm, yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, how on earth do you figure out, with, with finite resources, how on earth do you figure out what you should be focusing on? That's, that's an enormous range of things that you could be looking at. So, how, how do you start? <laughs> I, I mean, I think it starts from the policy. I, it's interesting because um, when we started in the clean energy space in 2011, uh, there weren't that many people that were thinking about how do you deploy all of this technology. Uh, we could help set the narrative about what it could look like to have a wide scale deployment of residential rooftop solar in low income communities, uh, as opposed to some of the sectors that Brian mentioned. There are a lot of people working in that. Um, state actors, local actors, nonprofits, for profits. And um, you know, we're thinking about how do you bring the Green Bank model there. And so I think it's a lot about what's already happening. Um, where is the capital flowing? Where is it not flowing? How can we um, provide that catalytic capital to help start to shift the narrative and, and to make some of these projects move? Um, and I think another big thing for us is, you know, we we are our, our um, our core strength is really in sort of that wide scale, um, smaller scale deployment to help homeowners and business owners um, improve their properties. And on the environmental infrastructure side, that's really different. You know, we're talking about parks. That is a community resource. That's no longer an individual resource. And how do you start to shift 
um, you know, are, are thinking about those kinds of projects and the stakeholder engagement that you need to ensure that you are making an investment that is what is in the community's best interest. So I think it's a lot of stakeholder engagement, uh, it's a lot of understanding the public policy and the context that we're going into, uh, and then it's getting the right people on the team to help us figure yeah. it out. So, we yeah. operate in a lot of policy opportunity, like so if we step back and, and maybe I'll, I'll lead us to maybe our challenge of thinking about green school buses and stuff. So, so if we just kind of parse all, apart all the different public policies that we're trying to support. So Connecticut has a reducing 45% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions from 2001 levels by 2030. That's equivalent to the nationally determined contributions of the White House of 50 to 52% reductions on 2005 levels, just to give a, a sense of what that is. We've got a 40% renewable portfolio standard. Uh, Sarah talked about the 1,000 megawatt battery storage target. We've got an 80% weatherization of households by 2030. Uh, several sessions ago, there was a bill that passed that was 100% um, of zero emission school buses in environmental justice communities by 2030. So we began to try to start wrapping our minds around the level of capital needed in all these different segments. So you're right, like how do you pick and choose? Um, you know, we have a great board of directors that helps guide us. Uh, we've got our chair uh, of the board, uh, Lonnie Reed was the former co-chair of the Energy and Technology Committee of the Connecticut General Assembly. So she definitely imparts uh, upon us the ways that policymakers think about these things. Uh, we've got an incredible staff who's having to wrestle with all these things from stakeholder feedback to capital providers to contractors in the market to customers and try to wrap our arms around how we can maximize uh, you know, benefits, meaningful benefits to constituents in our communities by per every public dollar invested. But I feel like we're we're we're, we're constantly like wrestling and, and trying to figure out the next thing that we should be catalytic on. Um, and and it, it does feel to me like maybe transportation is a little bit in the in that realm. I, I don't know. I don't know how you're. How you I'm glad that I've persuaded you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so yeah, transportation has historically not been an area of investment for the a priority area of investment for the Green Bank. You know, we have EV chargers wrapped up into our different um, commercial and residential offerings, but the vehicles themselves has, you know, they're they're incentivized by different agencies. Um, but in school buses, especially with this target to have environmental justice communities, um, you know, with, with clean school buses, there's, there's just so much there that makes sense um, for the Green Bank to get involved in. You know, it's, it's, it's children um, getting to school to do uh, their best in an environment that, that just, when you look at a diesel bus's impact on a student's health, it's enormous. Um, and also the difference in cost between a traditional diesel bus and the new electric vehicles is substantial. Um, right now, the traditional diesel bus is about $150,000 uh, to $200,000, and the new electric school bus is about $350,000. And so the question is, how do you get from uh, diesel to uh, the cleaner electric school buses without overly burdening the environmental justice communities that we want these buses to go into. You know, how do you not double the cost to the school district of transporting their students to school? Um, and how do you cite those buses in such a way where uh, if you plug 20 buses in at the end of the school day, you're not, you know, uh, uh, putting a big drain on the power grid that then all ratepayers will have to pay to accommodate uh, in that community. So. It just there's a lot of things there. Mm. there there are a lot of different markets where we're trying to make sense of the policies and the benefits and bring those together in the financial package because that gap that delta is pretty big so so then how do you think about um you know well you, you compare gasoline to electric power there's a cost savings there so the economics favor a zero emission electric school buses there uh, could we plug the buses in when we need them for a resilient uh, moment, right? Maybe the grid is down, maybe we can move the buses around, situate them, there's a resilience benefit there. So how do we begin to package all these different benefits to begin to look at not only the cost, but the benefits that these resources provide? That's what policymakers, um, we're constantly talking about cost, we need to also be looking at the benefits. Again, it reminds me of a conversation I had recently about uh, biodiversity and how people are, are trying to slice up and say, you know, what is the value of the polar bear? What is the value of, of ma maintaining our biodiversity? But I find that you, you miss quite a lot. You know, so if you're just trying to say, well, here is on this, this particular slice, that's the value of grid balancing for the bus. But and you, can add, you can add up a whole series of numbers in this column, but you miss like, what you were talking about, the, like the, the, the justice part of it. And like the, the health benefits, benefits for, for children of having, having um, you know, cleaner air. 
how do you how do you tie those two things together? How do you how do you make an narrative that isn't purely financial? So 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 this may be a bit out of the box, and and this may be uh, a, 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 an area that we're we're looking at and heading in the future. But but think about let's go to environmental infrastructure. Let's think about parks and recreation. Uh, think about something called a park prescription, where we might actually see doctors prescribing to their patients, go take a walk in a park three or four times a week. Let's do a pre and a post measurement and see what happens as a result of being exposed to nature by just purely going for walks on a daily basis or going and visiting, you know, trails that we have here in Connecticut, riding a bike, going and visiting a park, you know, a, uh, one of our state parks or um, our land trusts here in the state. Um, so, so to get to quantifying that benefit, is there a public health benefit that results by exposing people to nature? I think that is the type of stacking, social and environmental stacking that we're going to start to get to and bringing the healthcare industry, the insurance industry into helping think about those things just as we think about carbon offsets or ecosystem services or renewable energy credits in this way that's using public policy to mobilize capital we could uh, measure and think about the public health benefits that come from green space. Uh, I think this is uh, an area we're going to see in the next three to five years where the healthcare industry is going to come into our communities and be like, you know what, let's take those abandoned lots and rather than just clean them up, let's turn them into a green space. That green space from the green bank's perspective will not only help sequester a little bit of carbon, but it will also serve as a bioswell to, to absorb the storm water but it also gives a nice, quiet place for somebody in the community to heal, right? So I think we're going to start to see those things uh, happen uh, here in uh, you know, our communities. Um, but it's really trying to uh, take those hidden benefits and bring them into the market so that all market participants can see them and therefore invest in them and create more of them. I think that last part is the important part of the park prescription idea, which is that when you put rooftop solar on somebody's house, there's a really clear benefit stream that you can finance against. You know how much power it's going to generate. You know how much savings they're going to get based on where you are. The question with a park investment is, what is the revenue stream that you are going to finance against? Um, and so starting to bring in private actors that have an interest in that space, like an insurance company, starts to offer hints about how we can start to find that revenue stream that we can finance against. You know, I, I think that's that's sort of the, the Green Bank secret sauce there. And, and we can play on the history of innovation, right? Like U.S. states across this country are very innovative on a variety of things. You have people creating new technologies over here, over here. You know, Connecticut is the home to Frederick Law Olmsted. He was born here. He was buried here in the city of Hartford. We're the insurance capital, right? So, so how can we build bridges to that history, that innovation, that commitment uh, to uh, making our society better? by leading on certain things and demonstrating that small things can get done, they can deliver measurable impact, uh, it, with the hope that others will see it and replicate it. We're a small state. We're 1% of the U.S. population. We're half a percent of the greenhouse gas emissions. We contribute, I think, 2% to the federal uh, government in terms of our taxes, so we contribute more than our fair share. But. Um, you know, innovation happens locally, and if we can demonstrate these benefits and measure them, bring science in to show pre and post, then maybe we can create markets that don't exist today and externalize the internal benefits in our economy so that we can see more investment happen local. An entirely different way of looking at banking and thinking about banking. Banking as an institution yeah. is not this. Is not this. Yeah. <laughs> this is different. <laughs> Are there any lessons that uh, that mainstream banking can can learn, and do you think that they will listen? So, so one of our, our principal goal is using a little bit of public to mobilize a lot of private. Um, one of the metrics that we have uh, that deals with equity, our Justice 40 target, no less than 40% of investment uh, will be, and benefits will inure to vulnerable communities. Vulnerable communities has a defi definition public policy wise. We helped add a component to that definition was uh, CRA eligible communities, Community Reinvestment Act eligible communities, which is a 1977 federal policy that if you are an FDIC insured financial institution like a bank, uh, then you have to ensure that you are investing in less than 80% area median income census tracts. So well, what do we do? So we, we try to bring our financial institutions alongside us to be senior in the transactions. They want that financial protection of risk of repayment. So we're generally subordinated in the capital structure. We take the first risk. They're senior to us so that they can get their return out. 
but we're also delivering to them this CRA benefit because our priority is to make sure that we're hitting that 40% target uh, in vulnerable communities. Now these institutions are asking us for more and more deals and they're willing to go into more you know, riskier, riskier technologies. Um, so uh, it, it makes sense. Uh, you have to involve them, but you have to help address all those other risks to get them comfortable. Yeah, and you, you mentioned it a little earlier on that there's different flavors of Green Bank uh, throughout, throughout the U.S. Um, is there one kind of like common thread that uh, that kind of holds holds Green Banks together as a unit, or is there like is the kind of Green Bank the model that people try to cover, or how how does it differ on state by state? I, I mean, I think that the common thread is is that one that Brian and I have been talking about, which is public capital grants incentives, it's not going to get us to uh, the climate solutions. And so green banks are really at the intersection of public and private capital, trying to train the private capital markets on how to invest in the economy. That, that is consistent across all of the green banks, whether they're public, quasi-public, nonprofit. Um, but we do come in all shapes and sizes. We invest in all different sorts of projects. Brian said, like ours are mostly retail investments, helping homeowners and business owners improve their their properties. Um, other green banks are more focused on utility scale community solar, for example. You know, they're thinking about where in the market is it, it, it is this proven technology not moving that um, by having an innovative financial player like a green bank, you can mobilize that public that private capital investment into that kind of technology or, or to achieve the local public policy. Uh, there's a lot of really cool examples and models of, of things that are going on. Uh, we are the first uh, and so we do spend a lot of time working across the U.S. and around the world with other banks that are starting or um, sharing knowledge we learn from other green banks too. You know, um, the New York Green Bank has really taken a leadership role on um, investing in school buses and electric transit and we have a regular dialogue with them. Um, thinking about how they're going to hit their targets, how Connecticut can hit ours. We're right next door to each other, so is there something that we would do like along a corridor to ensure that buses could travel between the states? You know, th there's, there's collaboration and uh, coordination across all of us. Uh, and, and Brian uh, just joined a national, uh, as the chair of a national organization that ensures that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so I was going to say ditto. Everything, everything <laughs> Sarah just said there is absolutely right. And, yeah, so um, I'm chair of the Coalition for Green Capital, so kind of coming full circle from Reed Hunt being on this campus back in 2009 to really from 2009 through 2022, 20, uh, um, Reed has been not only, he was not only served on our board of directors of the Connecticut Green Bank and helped us create the policy here in 2011, but has been steadfast at the national level to help create a national climate bank whether it was the National Climate Bank, the U.S. Uh, Green Bank, the Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator, like literally every year legislation was coming up at the federal level. Um, I, I got a call, uh, it was, I, I want to say the 26th of July last summer, that uh, not this past summer, but the, the one prior, and my watch was going off and it was Reed and he just kept trying to reach me and I was like, what is going on? It was in the evening. So I called him up and he said, we just got word that Manchin and Schumer have reached agreement on the Inflation Reduction Act. And, oh, by the way, our Green Bank legislation is included in the bill. Um, it was a, a crazy, crazy moment because when you talk about a concept that failed in 2009 to pass, and then you slog like he's done over the years at the state and local level to get things passed and build momentum and demonstrate how the model can work in unique and diverse ways across the country. You know, it's very local. This isn't a national, this is a very local thing. Uh, it was a really exciting moment to see that. Um, and now we have the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, so we are, the Coalition for Green Capital uh, brought together a big green tent. We've got a lot of states, cities, community lenders across this country who have submitted a $10 billion application into the National Clean Investment Fund. This is 10 billion of the 27 billion, uh, so that we could effectively do uh, at scale what we're doing in Connecticut, what we're doing in Maine, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. Like, like we literally now have the tools. Uh, we're in a competitive process now. The EPA will make decisions next spring uh, and then um, uh, provide the capital to the winning national climate banks next summer. Uh, but with that will come the, you know, the replication and the scaling up of the Green Bank model around this country 
focusing on, yes, greenhouse gas emission reductions, air pollution reductions, but also, I would argue more importantly, uh, our low-income and disadvantaged communities, delivering meaningful benefits to our low-income and disadvantaged communities, not just reducing energy burden from clean energy, because we know clean energy does that, not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also creating the local workforce, delivering community benefits. And uh, that's kind of really nicely illustrates the, um, the nationwide um, nature of, of green banks. And what was really surprising to me was that uh, green banks are everywhere. <laughs> you yeah, know, they're, the they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're like in Texas, in, in Alaska, yeah. and like, you know, they're places that you wouldn't naturally think, you know, would be homes for, for, for the green bank. Um, what does that... And red states. And, you know, red states. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So what, what, does, what does it not being a kind of partisan issue, like a red, red, blue question, um, what does that say about climate finance as a, as a in general. I started my career as an engineer in Texas. I was there for five years and one of my big contracts was with the state of Texas going to provide energy audits to schools. They had a revolving loan fund for energy efficiency upgrades. I, I, it's just, uh, it's something that makes sense. You know, you don't need to talk the language of carbon and trees to uh, sell somebody on energy efficiency or renewable energy. You can talk the language of dollars and cents. Um, and. Uh, I had a mentor there that used to say, um, you're saving trees, but I'm saving money. Uh, and we were doing the same projects, you know? Um, and I think that for so much of, of the clean energy, energy efficiency movement, um, it, it's about having the right message when you're in front of the right audience and, and to custom fit it to the group that you're talking to. I, I don't think that um, clean finance is a, a blue state solution. I mean, what we've seen across the US is that um, if you start to shift your language around um, workforce development, around um, the, the financial savings that you can get, the benefits to the community, if you reduce the public health impacts of polluting um, generation technologies, that that can be a very resonant message with uh, people, not just around um, preserving the climate for future generations. <laughs> <laughs> small. Yes, small. Just, you know. Who cares about that? <laughs> And do you see the model expanding uh, great, like, like into like developing economies or like out, outside of the you know the great success has been shown in the yeah, US? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great mm. question. So we've definitely seen it. Um, internationally, we've got the Green Climate Fund out of Songdo, uh, South Korea, that is the UN's uh, Green Bank. Uh, but we definitely over the years have gotten a lot of developing countries uh, in the South, Africa, Latin America. Uh, who have asked us, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing here. Now, their systems of government might be different, so they're having to wrestle with, you know, the political economy of those structures. Uh, but no, the, the tool, I mean, if we all just step back and we looked at the Paris Agreement, you know, the Paris Agreement has three components to it. It has, we need to reduce our emissions, we need to increase our resilience, and the way to get those two things done is by mobilizing capital flows, right? So the notion of a green bank in the U.S., the notion of it in a developing country is all the same. Uh, I feel like we're getting more uh, people who are looking to partner with developing countries, invest in developing countries, saying, tell us a little bit more about Connecticut, what you do here. Close, uh, kind of changing tack uh, a little bit. So we've touched on it uh, a bit earlier on and the Inflation Reduction Act. So we've had, like last year, probably the, arguably rather, the uh, most important piece of climate legislation in the history of the planet. <laughs> like it's, it is, it's really quite something. Um, I'd, I'd like to get your perspective on how, how's, like a year in, has it been going? Well, you know, there's both of them, right? There's the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law go. and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, they both have been uh, groundbreaking in, in uh, I have to say, uh, as a person working in climate, I, about, a, about two years ago, I was like, what am I really doing here? Are we ever going to be able to shift the needle? And um, with the passage of both of those, I feel re-energized <laughs> that, that we can start to adapt and mitigate the impact of climate change. Um, in the Inflation Reduction Act specifically, there's two big parts that the Green Bank is paying attention to. One is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund that Brian mentioned earlier. It's essentially supporting the development of a national climate bank. It's the I'm going to get this right. It's the it's the program in the Inflation Reduction Act with the largest funding allocation to it. 
Um, so that has been incredibly exciting for the green banking industry and for um, community lenders that don't participate in green banking yet but are interested in expanding into that. There's a whole section of it that's, that's focused on um, training those and giving capital to those smaller community lenders uh, that, that are interested in starting to do green banking activities. So we're going to start to see a lot more across the U.S. The other big part of the Inflation Reduction Act um, is, of course, uh, the tax credits that are associated uh, with clean energy and the green economy and thinking about how do you create this predictable uh, incentive mechanism to provide investment into that technology, to build that technology, to build that technology here in the United States, um, to manufacture it in the United States, to have uh, robust um, workforce development uh, apprenticeship programs, um, to be paying our, our workers a livable wage, to be creating a sustainable um, workforce. I don't mean sustainable in the climate sense, but sustainable as um, you are not just there to build the wind turbine and then you don't have a job. You are there to be a wind turbine um, construction manager and, and that will be your job from now until you are ready to leave that profession, you know. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's just so much wrapped up in that bill that has really spurred uh, investment in the, the green economy. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, of course, also has a myriad of programs that are focused on different kinds of investment in community, in technology, in R&D, in um, how do we support low-income communities in creative ways, how do we bring the technology uh, and knowledge from the national labs into applications in the communities where we can really start to make a change. There's just so much in those two bills that, that have really changed everything for us. Yeah, and I don't know very many financial institutions who when on August 16th of last year, IRA was signed into law that spent an evening right after it was passed reading the 400 page bill and <laughs> like probably half of our staff did that and came back the next day super excited about what they saw in it. Um, I would say that the greenhouse gas reduction fund wasn't all that, you know, that some of them were staff members were interested in it, but they were super interested in, in all the tax credit elements of it because when we start to look at the role of financing and how we partner with uh, private lenders. The, the tax structure and direct payment and transfer payments, all the different things that the IRA does to make capital flows more efficient uh, is, is super interesting. Um, Sarah was talking about like just transition. I mean, the IRA is an amazing bill because it really embodies the values of President Biden. You, you have his 2035 and 2050 climate targets embedded in it, you know, to get to a zero carbon uh, electric sector by 2035, a carbon neutral economy by 2050. So if you just set those two things aside from a climate change perspective, no small problem, right? Let's just set those <laughs> aside for a moment. But the other two that he really lifts up are the just transition and justice 40. So you see all of that embodied in the tax credit structure. So Sarah was alluding to it. You're not going to get the full 30% investment tax credit unless you have prevailing wages and apprenticeships as part of your projects, right? So if, if you don't have those, then you're only going to get a 6% investment tax credit. So it's encouraging uh, local developers to make sure that they're building a sustainable economy that works for everybody. Then you get all these unique, really cool adders that come on top of it. So if you are located in an energy community and each state has its energy community, in Connecticut there are three different categories of them. You've got our Fairfield County uh, uh, Metropolitan Statistical Area. So if you are a, a census track in that area, then you would get a 10% bonus on top of the 30% investment tax credit. Um, there are projects that are located uh, within a census track of a formerly uh, a, a retired coal-fired power plant. We have two of them in Connecticut, New London and uh, Bridgeport. So if you're within census tracks immediately around uh, the power plant, you would get a 10% adder. Uh, if you're trying to develop a project on a brownfield, an EPA designated brownfield, you'll get a 10% adder. So the energy communities, you know, takes the 30% investment tax credit to 40%. Then you've got the low income communities adders where uh, the federal definitions around their vulnerable communities, they have their definition. You can get 10 to 20% adders even on top of that. So now you're talking about 50 to 60% investment tax credit from the federal government. 
And oh, by the way, if you do uh, uh, support technologies that are domestic content, now you're getting into industrial policy, right? And, and, and the federal government cares about that. As states, we care about that too. We care about local jobs and manufacturing. You can get up to 70% on the investment tax credit. So our team literally knows where all of those opportunities are now in our state and are structuring our financing products to be able to maximize the receipt of those tax credits to maximize the opportunities for our private partners to be there by, by our side because it's gonna require a massive amount of capital even though the, the gap has gotten smaller because we're getting federal tax credits. Uh, but we know where they are. Um, we wanna deliver those meaningful benefits to our communities uh, all around, resilience, reducing energy burden, creating jobs in our communities, uh, creating real measurable community benefits. So the IRA is right there for all of us to grab. And it's like a decade worth of tax credits, right? So I feel like a year in, our team knows all the data. We, we understand the law, the policy. Now it's like we're structuring our products to get ready to go. Uh, but we'll have nine more years to effectively uh, enable that deployment in our most vulnerable communities. But if I'm gonna make the counter argument, that very much um, channels you in directions that are picked by the federal government. So the, the tax credits are, are policies that you, know, you, may, you may happen to agree with them, but you, don't know, you no longer have the, the freedom to choose where you want to go on a state, on a state level. What do you see the, kind of the interactions between kind of the, the federal guidance and, and state innovation? I mean, I, I think that the, the tax credits that Brian just went through are carrots. They're not sticks. You can still do whatever you wanted to do before. A state could still pass policy and say, we want to include not just places that um, you know have retired coal fire plants. We also want to include places that have retired hydropower dams because we think that you know dams are whatever they might decide. You know, a state could still decide to do that. Um, it's just you are deciding to not take the carrot that the federal government is offering. I, I think that we are fortunate in that a lot of the carrots that the federal government is offering align with Connecticut policy. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> if, and if you look at that list, so we just talked about like section 48 of the tax code, right? There are uh, energy efficiency tax credits, $1,200 to $2,000 a year for every family that's like sitting there that you can grab. There are building tax credits. That's the world we live in, in terms of the small supporting families and businesses. But if you step back, there are manufacturing tax credits, there are nuclear tax credits, there are combined, you know, hydrogen tax credits. Like the list, the menu is there for every state to pick what it wants. You know, Connecticut, um, uh, you know, on electric vehicles, I'll just say something on like innovation on electric vehicles, because I think this speaks to the localness of innovation. Um, you know, Connecticut has a history on electric vehicles. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, we had an entrepreneur who manufactured uh, bicycles. Uh, he used his wealth to manufacture the first of 500 electric vehicles in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, the first presidential motorcade was Teddy Roosevelt in 1902 in an electric vehicle in downtown Hartford. So, you know, if we go back to thinking about what is the, the climate, the culture of innovation, each of our states, each of our cities has that. You know, we're, we're trying to find those entrepreneurs and support those entrepreneurs. Here we are 120 years later looking at EVs as the solution and trying to find the minerals and, and where we're going to manufacture the battery plants and what, what not. It's, it's really incumbent on us when we think about as a government uh, entity, a quasi-public entity, uh, what's our role in the manufacturing side of the equation, the innovation side of the equation, because we deal in the inf infrastructure. We want to just see the commercial technologies get deployed. But Sarah does a fantastic job on the innovation side. How do we think about maintaining those manufacturing jobs in our state? Not just the country, we compete against other states, so we want those jobs here in our state. And I think the electric vehicle and Pope uh, uh, manufacturing is an example of that. Henry Ford used to visit his plants. Uh, uh, Pope uh, loved Henry Ford. He just didn't believe the internal combustion engine was the future of transportation. And, and now we've got what we've got, right? So um, innovation happens in very different ways to the extent we can provide people with the capital they need. Had we been around, maybe back then, Bert Hunter may have developed a, a financial model for all the crowd watching that parade to access his technology, right? Maybe we could have changed the course of history for the better. Um, but uh, that tax code, the IRA, is literally a menu for every state you know, to go after. And, and I think one thing that the federal government needs to do, the, the Treasury, is to publish 
how much of that tax credit in each area is going to states because we want a race to the top mentality in this country. If you're not getting your share, then you, you better be doing something about it on a local policy level. Um, so the IRA, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, all those tax credits, super important uh, to, to confronting climate in this community while delivering all the benefits that we want to see in our society. Fantastic. And have you seen an impact? I saw the it's early days of, um, yet, but have you seen an impact on, on the green jobs, the idea of trying to, trying to on, re-onshore uh, U.S. manufacturing in, in this industry? Um, so we were talking a little bit about this uh, uh, last couple of days. What's important to us here in Connecticut, you know, each geography has, and we're seeing this across the country, the building of battery plants, you know, in the Midwest, uh, the building of uh, electric school bus manufacturing in Oklahoma, right? Like, like it's creating opportunities for the realization of manufacturing. What does Connecticut have going for it today? We may have had the electric vehicle opportunity back in the early 1900s. That no longer exists to us today. Things shifted. Uh, the, the industry that is ours to lose is the hydrogen fuel cell industry. So we have a thriving aerospace industry here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we've got two leading stationary fuel cell manufacturers in fuel cell energy and high axiom. Fuel cell energy is out of Danbury and Torrington. High axiom uh, is a South Korean owned company that's based in uh, East Hartford. Uh, so they, they uh, manufacture in Connecticut stationary fuel cells. Uh, we've also got an electrolysis company that's uh, a couple of cities up here from New Haven and Wallingford uh, called Nell Hydrogen. They actually manufacture the hydrogen electrolyzers that are being built and installed in Spain and, and producing the hydrogen for their zero emission buses, right? So there are opportunities for industrial policy to happen. Um, uh, one of my worries is that um, as states go after in these industrial policies that are important to them, that you get other factors outside uh, affecting and redirecting resources that may not support the industrial policies we're going after in our state. But uh, green hydrogen is definitely, I feel like, ours to lose as a state uh, industry. Um, hopefully, 100 years from now, there won't be somebody like Sarah and I in an interview saying uh, Connecticut lost its fuel cell industry, right, <laughs> um, because of something. But it is ours to lose, literally, today. I mean, the other th big thing for me on workforce development is community benefits agreements. Um, so uh, the, the innovation that's happened over the last few years in thinking about development of this kind of technology is a recognition that the energy industry has uh, done a lot of damage to communities across the United States. And even though clean energy industry uh, is building out with a love of humanity in our hearts, uh, a desire to save, um, future generations, the, the pain that is forecasted by the scientists at the UN, like that we are in danger of making many of the same mistakes that the fossil fuel industry made in terms of um, how we construct, how we identify parcels of land to build on. And um, one of the tools to make sure that we have community voices uh, as part of the development process in the clean energy space and all energy space uh, in the future, including natural gas infrastructure and pipeline development and everything else, is to, to start to form community benefits agreements. Um, and this is an idea that you can do an, uh, an in-depth engagement with the community before you begin development to understand um, what is the community's interest in this kind of project. Um, are they interested in having this in their community? Where would they like it to happen? What would they like to to be part of the agreement with that community to develop that project. And we are in the midst of doing um, an in-depth engagement like this in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, which is an environmental justice community that um, uh, you know, it is really working through a, a process uh, with the support of technical assistance from the National uh, Renewable Energy Laboratory to say uh, what is the, the, the energy goals of this community and how can um, the development of energy technology in this community support the community's goals as well. And a lot of times um, where that conversation ends up is workforce development. Um, you know, can there be um, opportunities for their young people to be exposed to uh, the, the technology at a stage where it might influence their career trajectory? Are there training opportunities? Are there opportunities for um, local higher 
hiring of people to work on those jobs that are being um, developed rather than hiring from out of state or out of the community. And um, how can we actually build that into the contract uh, as uh, for the development of that technology? So I, I think it's, it's, it's a different take on um, you know, uh, the, the development of technology and infrastructure that's for the benefit of all. I thought it was interesting that Sarah went to the community benefit agreements as I was talking about hydrogen fuel cells. So in 2022, the legislature passed a policy that said the, the Connecticut Green Bank will facilitate a conversation that leads to the development of a report uh, on hydrogen in our state. Uh, Sarah and I co-chaired that committee. One of the six recommendations that came out of that was to ensure that our um, just transition policies that require community benefit agreements for things like offshore wind, projects that are larger than a certain size, require every hydrogen project to have a community benefit agreement as part of it. That was a recommendation and the legislature uh, this uh, last session actually passed a bill requiring that. So Connecticut is probably the first state to have community benefit agreements embedded in its just transition policy with the hydrogen focus on it. And that's super important. Uh, you know, this is the community benefit that we're after. You know, I was, I'm reminded of, you know, the, the Green Bank tool can work. It can provide families and businesses with the capital they need to reduce energy costs. We know that it works. The question is, can we deliver more meaningful benefits? And uh, there was a book uh, written by Shalanda Baker, who's at the Department of Energy. It's called Revolutionary Power. And in it, she challenges the Connecticut Green Bank in our work with Posigen, which is a company that's doing this, uh, de deploying solar and energy efficiency and reducing energy burden. The question she, she poses is, what beyond that can the Green Bank model do? Can it uh, advance workforce in a community? Can it deliver wealth in a community? I think that's our big question, and, and it really feels like the IRA, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, all these tax credits provide us with the unique opportunity to realize value beyond where we've been uh, so that we can create the country that we aspire to be. Yeah, fantastic point. I kind of like, like I feel like clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, speaking of community benefits, one of the issues that we do get an awful lot of headlines about um, now, not necessarily in Connecticut, but in like Florida, California, is it's the whole idea of resilience and trying to kind of build infrastructure to protect against you know the worst uh, impacts of climate change. How do green banks think about this? Because they, again, it isn't something that's easy to be funding because there isn't a, an income stream, stream from it. And is it a particular issue in in Connecticut? It's like, are you are you seeing a demand from your from your communities for this type of like resilience? So I would throw out there that we have a a super um, committed commissioner of our insurance department, Commissioner Andrew Mays, who is a part of the Governor's Council on Climate Change that I was referring to before. Uh, he not only plays an important role in Connecticut's insurance industry, which is among the largest in the country, um, I was mentioning the insurance capital of the U.S. before, but he is also the incoming uh, president of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So again, a small state playing a big role in terms of a national market here. He is super committed to finding ways for the insurance industry to m help uh, make our families and businesses more resilient. So when you think about resilience, you know, how do you prepare for, respond to, and recover from what we're experiencing every day now? Like, like every state across this country is experiencing climate change in countries around the world in very profound ways. Right now in Connecticut, in our language, we have rain bombs. Literally, like this past summer, my watch went off five times because there was a deluge for 15 minutes in downtown Hartford of significant rain that overwhelmed the water system. Uh, we have rain bombs. We have heat domes, right, that come and sit over our, our, our states and cities for days, weeks at a time. We have polar vortexes. It, may, it feels a little bit like a polar vortex, but it's, but you know, we get these very uh, cold weather spats that come in and sit over, over, over us. How can we help our families become more resilient to that? So we're working now on a piece of legislation, fingers crossed, uh, with the governor's leadership uh, that may begin to help us realize some of that value of economic value that we see in energy. If we can help improve the resilience of our families and businesses by giving them a loan through their local community bank and credit union to do something at home, to do something at their business through our commercial property assessed clean energy law, then they should be acknowledged for that 
through a reduction of their insurance premiums. You know, the insu so those are the sorts of things that our insurance commissioners can regulate and require and build in. So I think that's, a, that's another frontier for us here in Connecticut to figure out is resilience. Um, uh, as we combat climate, it's not only about decarbonization, but it's going to be about resilience. I think you've, you've done a, a great job in explaining the benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I need to ask the question, now, do, you, do you guys um, believe that, you know, back like the likes of John Kerry, who suggests that whatever happens in the next election, uh, that the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act will continue to be, no, survive? <laughs> survive as opposed to rolled back in, in all its pieces. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, tax credit, you, as you probably know, having gone through the FDCE, mm -hmm. uh, the Financing and Deploying Clean Energy Program here at Yale, tax credit policy is a fundamental way to enable more investment in clean energy in this country. That has ironically been bipartisan over time. Uh, you know, it is a form of a grant, a federal grant. It's, it's, a, it's a dollar of a federal government going to a project. Um, I would hope that by uh, next uh, elections that were demonstrating the IRA uh, investment tax credits being put to work and enabling more investment so that it can be demonstrated that uh, families and businesses are benefiting from these policies by more investment, um, reducing energy burden, creating jobs in our communities, all the things that we talked about. Um, but, you know, things ebb and flow, right? And, and you know, maybe that's the resilience of our state uh, system, our federalist system is, you know, we can always come back to things here locally, um, but it sure is nice when you have a federal partner that is now there side by side with us because it, it will help us do things faster, quicker, and at a scale that, uh, uh, you know, we may not have been able to do without it. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. And there are certain programs like the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund that require that the funding be out the door before the Great next point. election. Um, so that really, you know, secures some of the funding at least. Do you think the climate will be part of the conversation in the next election cycle? Do you think it'll be, be something that moves the needle at all? I would suspect resilience will be a part of the conversation, right? So, so maybe it's not, we're not talking about climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but we're talking about wildfires, we're talking about droughts, we're talking about uh, hurricanes, and you know, so, so that conversation I think will, will be, be out there. Uh, whether we're talking about a price on carbon, I don't think we're gonna see that. Uh, I don't think we're gonna see that kind of regulatory conversation. My observation is that we are focused on um, a carrot strategy, which is to reward those who are delivering the things that we want to see uh, and staying away from the stick strategy. Um, so uh, as long as we can have a federal government that's willing to continue to provide carrots, then uh, as uh, green banks, as community lenders, we will find ways to mobilize private investment to take advantage of that uh, to help our local economies. Um, so, yeah. I hope so. I, you know, whenever there's a political discussion that doesn't involve climate, to me it feels out of touch. You know, we are experiencing climate change already in our communities, in our daily lives. It's, it's impacting um, us and people around the world. And to me, it, it's crazy that we could um, not have that be part of a discussion about our strategy as a country. <laughs> Just, and if you could um, write one, one piece of legislation to law in the morning, like um, Inflation Reduction Act 2.0, what, what, what would you have one, one, one headline? Well, I, I, I would, to this question, I would normally say just implement what we got because it's big. <laughs> so I, I always get worried about people refocusing on other things beyond what's big. But I guess what I would say is, is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is going to be successful, so give it more. Just as the Environmental Protection Agency has had state revolving funds for water, clean water uh, for years, let's have clean air and, and provide the EPA more funding to continue to take the GGRF beyond 27 billion and just do it every year partnering with states to deliver this. So that, that, that's what I would say is uh, uh, add to the Greenhouse Gas Reduction more. Fund and be committed to it on an annual basis. I feel like I need to lean into my innovation role in answering this question <laughs> because um, I, I think that what we also need in addition to the GGRF, and this is in the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, but a focus on commercialization of uh, proven technology. So a lot of projects are getting R&D funding to demonstrate at a pilot scale that they are successful. But there is, there is a big challenge in going from a successful pilot in one location to wide scale deployment. And I think that 
um, having federal backing for some of that expansion um, through organizations like the Loan Program Office at the DOE or through ARPA-E, which is also through the DOE, um, that can really uh, impact the amount of commercially proven available technology for institutions like the Green Bank to provide investment in. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I'm kind of a little surprised that there wasn't a kind of well, we kind of like a price on carbon. <laughs> you know, if you if you if you had a pen, you could write anything you want. You know, would have thought. Well, <laughs> let's, let's pay for extra now. Using markets is a, is a Republican thing, right? We're mm -hmm. going back to 2009, but uh, right now, you know, we can use markets in other ways by giving tax credits, and if they work, then then let's keep using them. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so just one final uh, question. Um, going back to uh, back to the beginning. Uh, it's about kind of your know, vision, vision values. Uh, see that the uh, the website uh, says that the bank's vision is a planet protected by the love of humanity, and is uh, part inspired by uh, uh, Maya Angelou poem <laughs> for an, uh, on on Pulse of Morning. A beautiful piece. Uh, which I had a look at it. So it was really lovely. Um, so the question is, where do you find your own you know personal e inspiration for the work you do? Like be, it might be art, it might be a poem, it might be a book, it might be some music, but where, where, do, where do you take inspiration from? Um, well, so, you know, our vision of Planet Protected by the Love of Humanity was, in, was inspired by a number of different things. In this case, Maya Angelou, as well as Mother Jennifer, as well as Mayor Muriel Bowser. Congratulations, Mayor. This is the Washington, D.C.'s Green Bank fifth year anniversary. Uh, so it's great that they're going to be celebrating that. Um, but no, when you think about a planet protected by the love of humanity, that kind of a vision statement. And I've been at meetings where I've said that, that to bankers, and you can hear the gasp in the room. It's like, what are you talking about love for? The love of humanity, like what does this have to do about it's capital squishy. mobilization? It's too, <laughs> it's too squishy. But if you step back, so we, one of the transactions that we did uh, back in 2017, 2018, was we worked with US Bank that was providing the tax equity into this structure of solar financing that we were doing that also included our local banks, um, Webster Bank, Liberty Bank, local banks in our community. We had built a capital structure to finance uh, uh, commercial projects. So here we were at a ribbon cutting ceremony and Mother Jennifer, this was at the Daughters of Mary of the Immaculate Conception in New Britain, Connecticut. And I get up and I'm talking about all our impact metrics, right? You know, we were able to take a limited amount of public resources to mobilize private investment. Uh, this investment's lead led to a megawatt of solar PV deployment. That megawatt of solar PV deployment is going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, right? So all the things that we think about in the public policy context. Mother Jennifer then gets up after me and, and really sets the tone for what this meant to them. She said, Brian, that is all well and good. That, yes, that's what you have helped us do. But you should also know that because of the energy savings we're receiving from that project, we're able to increase our summer programs for the young and the elderly, and we're able to increase our housing programs for the poor and the battered. Like, like that is an impact metric that you can't measure. That is love, right? So, so having a vision of a planet protected by the love of humanity is that. You can't have environmentalism without humanitarianism. You can't, you know, you can't save the trees by avoiding people. It is fundamentally about caring about each other. If we do that, uh, then we are going to solve the climate crisis, uh, but we have to be able to put our arms around each other first and, uh, and then mobilize capital investment second to deliver the, the results that we're after. But uh, I think that's you know, the vision of the Connecticut Green Bank, and I think our team, I hope our team you know, in the office you know, has a thank God it's Monday kind of attitude to just get back at it every, every week uh, because we have a super important purpose to deliver, and uh, they do it every day. Fantastic. Sarah, do you have a, a personal um, source of inspiration? You should let me go first because yours is inspiring <laughs> and mine's depressing. <laughs> like for me, it's 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 balancing, um, you know, complacency, optimism, and anxiety about the climate, and really trying to find that balance of we are doing amazing work. Things are going wrong in the world, uh, and also like how do you manage your own mental health when you're working on a generational issue that you individually can only contribute to you cannot solve uh, and you know might get worse and and figuring out like how do you stay recharged in that environment it's stories like the one that brian just told it's visiting places that are meaningful to you and thinking about how they're changing and how they're going to be influenced um, and 
yeah, really staying invested. <laughs> I think it's a lot about the community that we work in um, and, and the people that are sort of the end beneficiaries of, of our work. Thank you both so much. That was absolutely, that was nothing short of, that was inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was great to meet you. Thank you so much.